little past. I'm going to get started. So, um, so a couple announcements. Uh, maybe I'll repeat these at the end here when we get some more people. But um, so I had some questions, kind of looking forward uh, about the, the the first test. Um, so I just mentioned where we're at. Uh, we are. Uh, starting the next three weeks, we're actually going to be on the same chapter from the hands-on machine learning textbook. So we're going to get into kind of what I think of the most important part of this course. Uh, you know, if there's one part you're going to pay, con you're going to concentrate on, pay attention on, do it on this chapter four. We're going to go over linear and logistic regression, getting a little bit of the math uh, in this polynomial regression. Um, and uh, I, I, you know, we won't get too deep into it, but I hope that that by going through this stuff, uh, you'll get an idea about some of the most fundamental topics on machine learning, so fitting a model, what it means to train a model for supervised learning, uh, what decision boundaries are, what regression lines are, how those come about, that kind of stuff. So some of the stuff we've you saw in the second assignment, uh, but you you know unless you you've done stuff like this in another class or outside, you, you maybe didn't quite understand what was going on in terms of what the decision boundary was or some other stuff. So, so we're going to, you're going to hopefully, uh, uh, we'll get into that. Uh, you'll get a deeper understanding of what was happening when we fit a model like we did for the assignment too. So uh, my main plan today, I mean, well, I am going to spend uh, the first 30 minutes a little bit of a review, maybe not quite that long, but uh, go over assignment two here. Uh, in a second, see if anybody had any questions on that. I did kind of, I still had one or two people that hadn't gotten like a good submission yet, but I did go ahead and uh, kind of make a finalized, uh, and I post a, an example solution, so. Um, yeah, so I mean, after that, we're kind of halfway through the course, so just a reminder on that, since I did have a question already. Uh, I, um, um, the, the format might change a little bit, but I usually do give kind of a uh, uh, an empty IPython notebook for the test. It'll probably be time, but it'll still be relatively similar to what you're doing on the assignment. So it'll be kind of like an assi a timed assignment. So like the first assignment. Uh, so instead of instead of having to do stuff uh, inside of a project and submitting stuff to GitHub you might get a notebook that will be available um, when you start the test uh, and there'll be some like questions that you have to complete a function or something to get it to work and you'll submit that right usually the test is relatively simple so it'll be kind of similar to what you did on the first three assignments here uh, once you get the third assignment done so fit a linear regression to some data or logistic regression uh, make a plot draw a decision boundary some stuff like that. So, just a heads up on that. Like, and the other heads up I wanted to give is I am planning on kind of giving a. Um, I'm going to think of it uh, like a project, but it's going to be more like an open-ended assignment. So, sometime next week, I want to post some information about that. What, what I'm, what it probably, canonically, I'm going to post a couple of resources for data sets. So, free data sets that you can use. I'm going to ask people to pick a data set and kind of analyze it. So try and, and do some data analysis, uh, exploration, and cleaning, uh, and try and fit like a, a good model to it. Uh, but for a data set that you pick, maybe have some interest in, right? So I'll post some more information about that, but I'm going to think about that. That'll be so, something like our sixth or seventh uh, assignment. So we'll probably have s uh, three more assignments after the third one that we're going to start this week. Uh, and then that kind of more open-ended sort of project where you pick a data set and kind of apply. Uh, but but I, I do think, and you can propose something else on that, uh, but, uh, but I think mostly what I'll suggest people do is do a supervised learning. So either a regression or a classification task, pick a data set from one of the resources I give and, and try and explore it. Maybe try and do some feature engineering, uh, and then try and get as good of a model as you can uh, 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 to do predictions uh, on the data set. So. Um, all right, but yeah, that's kind of where we're at. Anybody kind of any administrative questions, course stuff, where we're at here? No? All right. Um, 
Okay, so uh, I, did, I did want to review a little bit of the assignment two. Uh, I've already got it up here. I, I did post an example solution in case you had some questions or wanted to compare some stuff. I, most people that did get it completed, except for one or two, I, I, I don't think really had any conceptual problems with this assignment. Uh, and, and most of the people that were struggling, it was, it was more procedural stuff still, right? So, so I don't know if that applies to anybody in here, but uh, I, I do, you know, I do think this is important. I do want people to kind of learn uh, secondhand, um, so it's not the primary purpose of this course, but learn typically uh, what the, um, like the structure of a project and how that works for like a machine learning project. So that does mean using um, the, the directory layout that we have. That does mean that you need to use relative path names whenever you're importing files uh, in order to get your code in. Um, and uh, whenever you're loading a data file, it does need to be relative to the root of your directory structure. So I was going to mention, you know, I don't know if there's anybody that's here right now that needs to hear this or not, but some people, you know, really, however, whatever you're using uh, to work on your assignments, whatever your development environment is, you should be able to use the same data, the, the same project structure, right? So I mean, this kind of relative path should work. Your notebook should be working, should be running in a directory that, that you can set up so it's relative that you go one up to, to find uh, where your data files are, or one up to find um, where your modules are that you're importing, things like that, right? And if you're still having problems with that, you know, I mean, definitely come and see me, office hours, or shoot me an email or something. Um, you know, I can help you get that set up. Right? If you're not using the containers, uh, like, like I suggest, you should still be able to successfully, you know, set up something that works with the kind of the structure as it's meant to be used, right? So, um, you know, I, I still had, you know, uh, three or four or five people, you know, were, were changing paths. Uh, I did have two people that actually changed the tests, which is kind of a big no-no. Um, so um, I, maybe I didn't mention that in class, but um, I'm going to use a slightly different test for assignment three. I'm trying, you guys are guinea pigs. I'm trying different things out to see what I, what I like, what I think works better or not. But for this one, you were given tests in the form of doc tests, and I had one or two people change the tests so it would pass for the code they'd written. And that, that's backwards. So if I give you tests, you have to write code to pass the test. You can't change these, these things. So, so you, you can't change the, the expected parameters for the model. You have to get your models to work so they, they, they get the right slope and intercept or model parameters or whatever. And you know, if you have questions about that, that's, that's fine. You know, let me know. So if you don't understand, like, uh, so one person like um, was pretty much like correct, except for example, um, uh, like for the scikit learn, I was, or was it stats model? I was expecting that you just return back the, just directly return back the coefficient. So that, that meant that uh, whatever was returned back um, as what I called the slopes here, um, you had to access it like this in order to get the value. Um, um, and that person was mostly correct, but they were, they were pre-accessing the, uh, the item, the index zero item, which was another array if, if you just return back the coefficients, right? So again, if you don't quite understand, I mean, you do have to get it so that you, you can't modify these tests. You have to get it so that these tests work with what you're returning back. Uh, but, but if you have questions about that, definitely ask me about that. So in that person's case, uh, they, they could have had them easily passing if they were just, just returning it like that. Um, um, and and you would get, they would, would have been getting the right results and getting those uh, tests not to crash when they ran them. So. So I know, I mean, simple things like that, uh, until you understand it and get past it, can be a big stopper, you know. So think about them. I do want people to get comfortable reading code and understand what's going on uh, and using tests like this. You know, I guess not, prim not a primary purpose of this course, but it's a good kind of skill uh, uh, to, to, to have, to know how to do. Uh, but, you know, don't struggle too long. So email me or or ask to set up a meeting.
Um, but that means that you do need to start earlier. So some people definitely didn't start until like Wednesday or Thursday or something. So, so you know, um, I one person has already started on the assignment three. Assignment three is available. I would encourage you to encourage you to at least accept the assignment uh, and read the assignment description. Right, get an idea of what we're doing on it. So, but um, um, back to um, uh, kind of a, a thing about content. Uh, really, a lot of the majority of the assignment is stuff uh, in our chapter four that's on the polynomial regression and stuff. So I'm going to try and actually talk about that stuff. I, I had it listed as next week, next unit, but I'm probably going to try and start talking about that Thursday at least. Uh, what polynomial regression is and things like that so that we can uh, make certain that you guys can get started knowing the stuff you need to know to get working on assignment three. So. All right. Um, okay. But yeah, I didn't really mean these to be that difficult, right? So, I mean, once you figured out how to do one of these, all the other ones, well, the, the, the task one SK learn, the task one stats model, and the task two SK learn stats model were pretty similar. You just had to, you know, create a model and fit it, um, and then with the X and Y that was passed in, and then pull out the expected parameters that were returned. So I, I did have two or three people also. Again, you know, you shouldn't modify these tests. So, so if I was saying that it's supposed to be returning these one, two, three, four, five, these six parameters, you needed to return those. Some people were trying to tack on some new things um, because. Uh, so I know why they did that. So you were creating the predictions here, and then somebody was like returning their predictions because they wanted to use those afterwards. Uh, but yeah, the correct thing to do in this case would have been, you know, you need to return what's asked for, so you can't really modify what's being expected to be returned. You would have had to just re, uh, uh, redo, recreate your predictions where you needed them in your notebook afterwards a second time instead of trying to change what's returned on this function. Um, all right, that I mean, you know, let me know, the, but. Hopefully that's clear for everybody that's here, right? So don't change these tests. Don't change the expected return values. You do have to do something similar for assignment three. So I, I, I don't know if I really like this. I'm, I'm trying to figure out some better stuff. Um, there is one task on assignment three that's a little bit different than this, uh, where you have to write a function um, rather than kind of really like this, which is really just fitting a model and then extracting some parameters and returning them. But you have to do the same thing again on assignment three. So if you didn't quite get what was going on, let me know because yeah, we're going to continue doing this here. So. But yeah, don't don't change tests uh, and, and just don't change these the signatures of these functions. So it should take what I give you as input and it should re be returning what is said that needs to be returned as output, whatever you're called. Um, all right, I, I didn't really have a lot of content for, for the majority of people besides four or five that are still kind of struggling. We're, we're pretty much fine, um, you know. Um, um, I had some people kind of by hand like iterate over all the parameters to get, like, get these and um, um, instead of using like describe um, so, you know, I mean, I guess that's fine, but uh, there are functions that are meant for that kind of stuff, you know. So I always go and, and like you describe, to get a idea of the, um, the, uh, the, the mean and the ranges of the, all my numeric variables. It's kind of one of the first things I always do, do exploring a new data set. Uh, maybe use info, you know, instead of going through all the ones by hand to, to find how these ended up being read in. So whether they got in as numeric types or uh, things didn't look like they were read in, uh, were read in as strings that maybe I need to do something to fix those, that kind of stuff. So uh, I think everybody pretty much figured out how to do a correlation matrix. You can use, um, you can use uh, things from like Seaborn. 
Uh, I don't know if I, I think I've probably shown that before, but uh, you can make nice heat maps from those uh, correlation matrices. So I mean, it's hard to, to kind of see these numbers. So you know, if you have more than than a a binary confusion matrix, you might want to actually plot it out um, so you can help visualize uh, which things are highly correlated and which things are kind of zero or not really correlated. Um, I did have one comment on a lot of people, it's a nitpicky thing, but um, I mean, most everybody was was fitting um, a regression line, although some people use Seaborn. Um, I did have that, um, 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 although for that one or two people that use Seaborn, I would encourage you to go back and make sure you can kind of do it by hand. Uh, but we will have more about that in this class. So once you fit a regre regression line, uh, you should, uh, w you know, we're going to learn to understand what those coefficients are and how that relates to this idea of what the best line is to, to fit to a set of data points. So yeah, I was hoping people would I could fit this by hand, but I had some people um, here notice it's nitpicky, but this won't work for the assignment three. Um, so here in this example solution, um, I create an array, a different array I called x hat here, um, and I fit my model to those points. In fact, I really didn't have to do this uh, because um, oh no, I, I do so. Here, it, it's a line, so I really only need two points. So all I'm doing is I'm creating an array that has x, the, the minimum, so something like zero, and maximum. So there's really only two points uh, in this example solution where I plot the line. Um, and then um, I create the, the corresponding y's for those two points by doing what I I told you. So taking the slope times the, the point and adding on the intercept. Right. So the result, if you look at this, uh, I should be able to um, should still have these available here. So I mean, um, x was really just uh, 0 0.1 and 24.7. That was the, the the minimum data point had an x value of 0 0.1, close to zero, and the maximum was 24.7. But since this is a linear solution, I really only no need those two points to find the resulting fitted line, right? So uh, by, by taking the intercept and the coefficient uh, and doing that vectorized operation, we also end up with uh, the co corresponding y points for those that I called y hat in the solution. Right? So for point one, uh, the, the, that point was at a y value, an evaporation of Point four zero, and for twenty four point seven, it was at eight point six five. That right? Yeah, I guess that's right. A little bit above eight, eight and a half. So, um, so well, I, uh, yeah. So, uh, my thought, my interruption was: some people were doing something like this, um, just taking all of the x values. So I called it, uh, I might have to rerun this here, but um, um, I called it uh, capital X above here that I was using to fit the model with uh, uh, when we pass it in here. So um, the problem with this is these values in X are, are the X values of all of these, right? And they're not sorted. So for a linear model, if you use all the values, um, I mean, it'll still look like a line, but it's really a bunch of line segments going back and forth since these aren't in any sorted order. So you don't see any problem uh, if you're visualizing a linear model. But if you do that for the data set for, for assignment three, uh, that's a curved line, uh, you know, so, so if the model is something like this, you're going to see a, a bunch of things like that, the line segments from, from the data since it's not in any particular sorted order. And the correct thing, you know, to visualize your fitted model is not to sort the original data point, it's to create a new set of data points. So like I did here, but for a, um, um, for a, um, uh, for a 
nonlinear model that's a curved line, you'll need more than two points. So we'd have to do something more like, uh, you know, x hat equals, uh, like, create like a linear space from minimum to maximum of 100 points or 1,000 points, whatever sufficient to visualize your curve, right? Keep that in mind if you did. I didn't take any, any points off for that, but um, but yeah, it's um, it's um, it's not correct to do something like this if you're by hand visualizing your linear model or your decision boundary uh, to to use the the, the data points. Uh, you really need to create a different set of points uh, that goes over your distribution um, um, in a ordered way. Um, what else? So yeah, like I said, it, although you know, that was that was fine. I probably should have mentioned. I, I really wanted people to, to not use. I mean, you could have used uh, the Seaborn or other things to to calculate the linear line for you. Uh, but it would be a good if you did that to to go back and redo it by hand, at least to make certain that you kind of understand what's going on here when you create a fitted line um, from your model coefficients. Um, and uh, yeah, let me know if people have questions on stuff so, um, about the assignment. Um, what else? Uh, yeah, I didn't have a lot of comments. I think so. Most everybody was doing pretty much like what I what I thought needed to be done to uh, remove the missing values from the features, um, to encode the categorical variables. Um, so I, I think I, I don't know if this helped or not. But um, you know, when I've done this assignment before, without these these tests, I had a lot of people switching around the yeses and the nos. But I don't think anybody was doing that. But I think you were forced to get them in the right order. Uh, you know, the no's were the zeros and the yes's uh, as encoded as ones um, by these tests here. So. Um, uh, and, you know, again, I mean, I often have people have problems with this, but I didn't have so many except for one or two people. So if you didn't get the decision boundary, um, you know, it's similar to when we fit the line, except you need a slightly different equation. Uh, and, and again, also, like I was saying, you really only need two points since it's a linear decision boundary. Um, but uh, th I mean, this notebook is posted, so if anybody wants to bring it down and look at these solutions, but um, uh, for the decision boundary, you know, if you use the kind of the equation that was given here uh, for your two points, um, um, you should have gotten the right um, uh, line there. So. Um, and again, you know, uh, we are going to, one of the things when we talk about logistic regression and decision boundaries, hopefully these things will make more sense, especially this one, um, uh, how this decision boundary works. So. But you should be able to see, I mean, basically the fitted model, everything on one side of the line, like I've already mentioned, uh, is going to get predicted as um, a no, and everything on the other side is predicted as a yes. So, so you can see that some, some things for the original data would get mispredicted. So every, everything that's not a red X uh, would be would, would get incorrect uh, for this model that was fit here. Um, um, I think you know everybody was giving me was was giving me a legend. Hopefully, I didn't miss that for anybody, and, and was labeling the axes. Don't uh, don't don't change the figure sizes on these. Um, so some people were changing the figure size. I, I guess maybe because it looks better on your environment. But if you can try to remember to, to remove that, uh, you know. So I'll, I'll usually set the figure size to something because I usually look at every figure plotted side by side just to uh, real quickly. It makes it easier for me to tell whether the figure looks exactly correct or there's some problems or not. So, um, I'm 
So, hmm, what happened there? So I didn't see anybody have that problem because I, I think because I changed something on my code above. My solution's not working anymore. Anyway, hopefully the notebook I posted is <laughs> not doing that. What did I do? Um, oh, because I modified this up here, it caused a problem. Um, anyway. I'll get that back, see if that fixes everything. Okay, sorry about that. Yeah, I messed up my notebook. What do I do now? Um, okay, and I think that was it. There you go, that looks better. Um, so yeah, um, I don't know, um, I mean a lot of people did the extra. I, I wasn't really given extra credit, except if, if I took away a point or two, I might have given it back. Um, so. So yeah, if you did what was kind of suggested on that uh, extra one, you probably, and, and also if you use the same logistic regression model, like from scikit-learn with um, the, um, um, uh, using LBFGS and that parameter for C, you probably find, I mean, even when you do cross-validation, um, it's gonna uh, fit much better. So that, 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 uh, that particular parameter um, is pretty predictive of whether it's gonna rain or not, which, um, which is a bit strange because you know that it's kind of tough to, to tell whether some whether um, uh, you know whether whether it's going to rain tomorrow or not. So, but uh, but yeah, you should probably have gotten quite a bit of an improvement by using that parameter on the last one. Um, okay. Uh, so any any questions or comments about the assignment two? You want to ask anything before I move on? All right, well, so, um, yep, so that's up there to look at if you still have some questions about some things, so I encourage you to go back and review a bit, um, make certain that you're clear about, uh, you know, how these things are supposed to work. We'll be using the same stuff uh, in terms of, like, uh, writing stuff in a function and testing it uh, for the third assignment and probably for all the rest of the assignments in the class, so. Um, all right. Okay, so let's let's get on to new stuff here. Uh, uh, so let's start talking about linear regression, logistic regression. Let me go ahead and open up. Um, hopefully, I did check all this, but hopefully, all the stuff is running now.
Okay, right, there we go. Hopefully we're ready. So, um, so yeah, starting with this week, we are on chapter four. We're going to be on this chapter for the next couple of weeks here. So really, um, um, uh, this, this first notebook I'll go over here today uh, is really kind of the stuff from the linear regression. Uh, but yeah, there's also the concepts of gradient descent and stuff uh, in here. So this is all, this is all kind of important uh, kind of foundational stuff here. Um, and then uh, the second notebook is kind of all the polynomial regression and the learning curves, which we'll be using a lot of those in the assignment three. Um, and then logistic regression um, is kind of the third notebook in the sequence here. So, Rerun, make everything, make sure everything's running in here. All right, good. So um, we've we've already been using linear regression, uh, but um, uh, if you've only taken this class before, not another class, uh, you might not know, you know what we're doing, what it's doing behind the scenes. Uh, some stuff I do, you know, that, that you should know at this point from this class. We're doing supervised learning, okay? So, so two, the first two thirds of the course is where we've got labels. Uh, we build a model, uh, we, we train a model to fit and, and predict from the, the, the training labels that we have, okay? So that's what supervised learning is. And there's two classes of supervised learning. Um, there's regressions. Right. The main difference being that um, you know regressions, uh, the, the labels, the things you're trying to predict. So, so these have uh, a real value number. We try to predict like a house price or something like that. Uh, that could be anything within the range. Um, so the float value, where these are going to be some sort of class. Um, so usually, uh, so the simplest being like a binary classification. So the, um, uh, but, but uh, for the labels you're trying to predict there are going to be a discrete set of values. Uh, the, and the simplest is just two values, yes, no, or zero, one. Um, so, uh, um, linear regression, uh, so a lot of machine learning models work, a lot of supervised machine learning models work the way linear regression does. Not all of them, so we'll look at some things that work, uh, that, that create a model in quite a bit of different ways, especially like trees, right? Uh, but things like support vector machines, linear logistic regression, others fit models uh, in, in, in a similar way to what we're uh, going to talk about here for linear regression. Okay? So let's go back. So, so uh, we've used this data before, our, our house price data. Uh, this is the one the textbook uses uh, for chapter four to introduce uh, linear regression. Um, um, so in this case, what we've got, uh, this is a very small one. Um, so we've only got 47 samples here. Um, uh, and we've actually just got two features. Oh, uh, well, we've, got, we've actually got one feature. So we're going to start with linear regression where we have one input feature uh, and one value that we're going to try to, to model or predict, right? So we're really going to be using the house size in square feet as the feature. And based on the house size, we want to predict uh, the price, uh, what, what the house price is. So I think this is in thousands of dollars. So 300, 340 means 340,000. So the minimum of 125, 169.9 is is a house that sells for 169,900 dollars in this data set. Um, so when we're fitting a model uh, uh, where we've got just one feature, uh, we want to try to predict price from it. Um, Basically, 
in some sense, we want to fit a line, uh, the, the best line for this data here, okay? So uh, we need to figure out what we mean by, you know, what is the best line? What, 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 how do we evaluate what, what is the best line uh, for this data, right? So I mean, all, if all these points were all exactly on a line, it would be obvious what that line should be that we should use for predictions, right? But, but these, these obviously, we can't fit them on one line. So pick any two points, uh, it'll go through those two points, but probably not any of the others, or only one or two of the others. So you could draw many lines, and I wish I could plot this. I wish I could display this up on a whiteboard. So, so you can have many potential lines. There's an infinite number of lines, but we need to figure out which is the line that's best in some sense of what we mean by best here. All right. Um, okay. So, uh, but, but before we do that, if you went through my notebook or the uh, chapter, uh, a little bit of review, right? A little bit of math review. Um, This also might be a good point for me to uh, remind you. I also do recommend uh, Dr. Ng's lectures. Uh, so these are covering the same stuff. He does pretty well, though, I think, on uh, giving some intuitive grasp of some of the mathematics that will go on in here. So there are notebooks uh, for his um, um, under the lectures, uh, under the Dr. Ng's class lectures. Uh, in there. So in particular, the linear and logistic regression, uh, to the two linear regressions and the logistic regression cover some of the same things. And you can watch his videos too if you want. So. Um, all right. So if you recall, the, you should be familiar with the, the, you know, how you specify the equation of a line. So uh, a line can be, uh, can be the equation for a line can be derived if, from any two points on the line, right? Uh, and this is the, the standard uh, slope-intercept form of the equation that we use. So you should have learned this all the way back in high school or before if we did some geometry or something like that. Where um, um, do they usually do this? Algebra? Or, no, probably geometry. Um, so the, the slope, like, like if I want to find the equation for the line for these two points, uh, that, that's really just a measure of if I go some distance uh, on the x, like 500, how far do I go on the y, right? So that, that's really what the slope is. It's the ratio of the change in y to the change in x. So I, I can calculate that for these two points here. I've, I've got, uh, I'm just using the first two points uh, in this data set that was used for chapter four here. Uh, so that's what we plotted. We just plotted the first two points. Um, if I want to find the slope uh, is the ratio of the difference in y. So, so y1 minus y0 is going to be the, the difference from 400 to 330. So it's going to be approximately 70. Um, likewise, it's going to be the difference of those. So it's going to be approximately 500. Right? So if you do those, um, what did I say? So like 70. You get around there, right? So the actual difference, the actual ratio, if I take those two points, is that um, for the first two points of this data set. Right? So that that's that's the slope. So so the line that goes through these two points always has that slope. So so if I want to find out what the point is that that's where we go 100 point 100 distance further on x, uh, I would use that slope to to find the corresponding y. Um, but there's many lines that have that same slope. So I have the same line, but you know, uh, below it with the same slope or, or above it, right? There's an infinite number of lines that have that same slope. So I need, you need a second parameter, right? So this is why for the linear model that you created of one feature on assignment two, there was two parameters, the slope and the intercept. So we have the what we called the intercept coefficient, and the uh, the, 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 co the there was just one value in the coefficient, which was really the slope uh, of the fitted line that we got when we did our linear regression. Right. Um, so to determine the intercept, we can just go back to our equation here. So um, I, I can rearrange, and, and, and so now that I, if I know the slope, I can find the one line that goes through one of those points. 
uh, by rearranging, so B equals Y minus MX. Um, uh, and plugging in either of those two points will tell me what the intercept is that I need to get the line that has that particular slope that goes exactly through that one point that I put in there. Right. So anyway, so if you follow that, so we've got uh, this slope should correspond to that line and that intercept uh, at 107 should correspond. So if we plot that, uh, let me replot this here. Um, um, oh yeah, I, I did this on purpose. Uh, so these were the, the points that we had. I replotted those so we can see the x uh, at zero value here, um, uh, where x is zero, right? So um, so yeah, I mean, you know, if you ask. For to, to do, if you have Matplotlib to do a plot, uh, we're asking it to give you a line instead of like a scatter of the points, um, it will connect up the line segments. Right? Um, uh, but yeah, in this case, we created uh, a, a line, we, we created two points. So there's really just two points from 150 to 220, right? So, so uh, we got a little bit beyond the ends here. So, uh, you know, is that 1600 and 2100? But if I wanted to, so I think the reason why I was doing this is so we could also extend the whole line all the way down to zero to see where that intercept term comes in, right? So let me, maybe I'm spending too much time on this. So, um, you know, uh, this should be ringing some bells. It should be kind of familiar to you. You've done this at some point uh, in the past here. So uh, we rerun everything above this here. So, so right. If, again, I, I'm only I'm only plotting two points, but I'm going from zero to, to 2200. So I get this line. Uh, the point being is that the one, the inter the reason why it's called the intercept term is that it, the interpretation is that's the location when x is zero. What what the value of y is going to be? Um, and again, that should be obvious from the equation. So when x is zero, this goes away. So when x is zero, y is going to be at b, the the intercept term which was that 107 point something for this line here. Um, okay, but, you know, so that, that's just reviewing. So what is the equation of a line? Um, given two points, how do you find out that equation? So given two points, uh, two parameters will exactly um, determine the equation of the line that goes through those two points, right? So you just need the slope and the intercept, right? So keep that in mind. Or another thing to keep in mind is that if I have one input feature and one label, I actually need two parameters uh, for my model that represents the, the mapping from one input to my output label that I'm trying to model, all right? So one feature needs two parameters. If I have two features, I actually need three parameters. So you need one more parameter than the number of features when you're fitting a linear model like this. Okay. But, um, you know, we have a slightly different problem, though, to get back to what we were talking about. Um, um, yeah, like here, uh, let, me, let me change this back so that I'm only plotting. Um, Uh, in that range here. So if I look at the first three points, and this is kind of done by purpose, but um, again, what we're trying to work up to is if I have three points and I want to build a model from those three points, what is the best model? What is the best linear model that I can create that would represent the fit of those three points, right? I mean, I could just use my original line, right? Is that is that good or not if, if I have a third point like this? Or I could have another line that goes through those two or something intermediate, right? So, so again, if I, could, if I had a whiteboard, uh, maybe the best model is something that doesn't go through any of these, but uh, and, and so that's working up to, to, to what I want to say is what we want is we want to have some measure of a, of a line that gets 
as close to all these points as possible for some definition of close, right? So we want to be formal for what we mean by close or formal, some formal definition of the goodness of the fit, right? And, and um, that's kind of the essence of linear regression, right? Uh, being formal about what we mean by the best line, the one that's closest or best fitting, okay? Uh, So that all is by way of introduction to the idea of a cost function, right? So what I mean by this formal measure, we need some formal measure of, so if I draw two lines, which one is a better fit, right? Or the, the reason why people call this as a cost function is it's going to measure um, um, how, uh, uh, whether something is uh, higher or lower cost in terms of uh, the fit, right? Where if it's a perfect fit, it'll have zero cost, and non-perfect fits will have higher costs, okay? Um, so, and, and we want this, th so this, this function, this name has many different names. So it it kind of came about because of uh, linear regression was sort of rediscovered or redone in different domains, different, uh, different, um, um, disciplines. So, so some people call, call it the cost function. That's more from engineering. Some people call this like a fitness function. Uh, there's other names for this, but they usually they mostly mean the same kind of thing here for our purposes. Okay. Um, but also another point about this is we really want to have some measure. Uh, that works so we can give up, come up with one number for the goodness of fit. Uh, so th for the fitness or the cost uh, for any number of points, right? So again, if I go back, th this was actually the original line that went through the, the two point, the first two points. But is that a good model, a good fit for all the data points that I have that I'm trying to create a model of, right? Uh, it kind of looks not too bad, um, you know, that was kind of by chance. If I picked a different two points, like if I picked these two points, I have a line that would probably should intuitively feel like a bad fit for you, right? Um, for me, the, the slope is probably about right for some intuitive idea of, of the fitness of this. Might be a little bit high, so maybe the intercept is a little high. Maybe you should go down a little bit, you know, right? So intuitively, you want something that is in the center or, or as close as possible to all the points for some idea of closeness. Um, okay, so um, uh, we'll come back to the cost function, but um, so we've already been using linear regression on your assignment two, a couple of examples of it. Uh, here's another way that you can fit um, a line and model. So in some sense, the best line uh, for um, our model here, right? Um, so what this is telling me is that if I want to fit a degree one model, which is basically fitting a line to all to those 47 data points, uh, you can use the polyfit method from NumPy. I think I asked you to use polyfit on your assignment three, um, maybe. Um, this does the same thing as using the linear regression from scikit-learn or the linear regression from stats model. Uh, but this is telling me that uh, this returns back, notice this returns back two values so since I'm returning a line, it returns back the two coefficients, like I talked about, that we can interpret as the, the slope for the best line, the, the line that fits the best, and the intercept. Right? So it's telling me, remember that we, we calculated the slope was um, 13 uh, for those first two points when we all went all the way back to, where was it, uh, right here, right? had a slope of 13.138 um, and an intercept of 107.6, right? But that was just the equation of the line through the first two points in the data set. So polyfit is telling me that the best line has a slope of close to that. So like I was saying, that the slope was pretty close to the, the best fitting slope uh, that, we, that we had uh, just by chance. Um, but, so the best slope is 0.134, so 0.138. 
it's a little bit down, like we were saying. So it doesn't intercept at 107, it intercepts at 71 when x is 0. Um, and we can plot that best line. Here. Yeah, so this was, this was our first one that was just kind of by chance of the first two points that we picked. This is, the, the polyfit function is telling us this is actually the best line. This is the one that has the highest fitness or the lowest cost. All right. uh, the line that, of all the infinite number lines, the one with a slope of 0.1345 and an intercept of 71.2. Okay. Um, and uh, that should be the same line that you would get if you do, so all of the things like from Seaborn, if you ask it to fit a line or set of data, it's using the same fitness function. If you ask for a linear regression from scikit-learn, if you don't change the parameters, if you use the default, it's going to use the same fitness function. You should get exactly that same line um, that we're showing here. Um, okay, so again, working up to the idea of a fitness function, um, um, let's think about um, uh, fitness function or the cost function. So we can generalize the idea of a line, right? So, you know, the way that, that these work in machine learning is of all the infinite possible lines, which one has the lowest cost, is the best fit, right? So we can generalize that idea that, you know, what I need to do is I need to find the value of the intercept and the slope if I only have, uh, you know, one parameter. Right? So, so again, we're, we're doing the simplest regression problem here. We've got one uh, input parameter and we want to build a model that, that predicts the, out, the one output from that one input. Right? Um, so I have among those, uh, the, the, you know, uh, Dr. Ng in lots of places use theta. So we're just starting to use some mathematical notation here. Uh, there's a reason why we do this. Uh, actually, we talk about it right here. So uh, we're going to generalize this to where we have more than one feature. But it, the, the math works. Uh, we can turn this into doing matrix multiplication, so, so doing linear algebra uh, problems um, um, to figure out the best line once we come up with the idea of our cost function here. Right? But back to our simplest case, we need a, a theta 0, uh, which is what we were calling the intercept term before, and a theta 1, which is what we're calling the slope. We need the values for those that minimize the cost, that gives us the best fitting model uh, once we define what we mean by that. Right? Um, but yeah, this is all about kind of terms here. So um, um, theta 0 is the intercept term, theta 1 is the slope term, and if we have multiple parameters, you need a theta 1, 2, 3 for every one of the input features. So you have a coefficient for every one of the features that you're fitting a linear model to like this. Uh, y hat is the predicted model, so we're, we're going to usually call y, the, the actual regression labels will be y that we're going to build our model from, uh, and once we have a model, if once we have a, a, a model means we figure out a theta 0 and a theta 1 for the, 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 the small, the easiest case here of one input feature. So once you have a theta 0 and a theta 1, you can make all your predictions, or you can make a prediction for any particular input what is my predicted output? So that's what y hat is. Uh, we usually use y hat for predictions given a particular theta zero and a theta one model. Right. Um, um, uh, for reasons that we'll see, we all we, we label these x one two three four five um, as it kind of goes into here. Um, I'm skipping ahead a little bit, but um, when we turn this into doing matrix multiplications, uh, we can consider that we have a dummy x0 parameter here that all, has all the values of 1. Um, and that was what you were doing when you used the stats model, that you had to add in the, the dummy constant parameter. Um, so to make it easier to do the math, uh, we can consider the most general case that we have parameters named x0, or features named x0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, however many features we have. And we have parameters, theta 0, theta 1, theta 2, theta 3. We have to treat the, the intercept term a little bit special, but we can do that by just having a dummy feature that's always 1 
for the intercept term. And then these will always be whatever the input is for like the square foot for only one feature or later on when we use more features for the house, this might be square foot, number of bedrooms, average income, so on for our X1, X2, X3 uh, features that we have. Um, right, and, and I should come back to this, but basically the reason why we do this is we can turn this into um, um, uh, linear algebra notation. So we can think of it as some set of, the uh, as a matrix or a vector multiplication of a vector of thetas times a vector of features, x0 through n and theta0 through theta n. Right. But uh, we'll come back to that. Um, I skip anything. So, oh, um, also, this will be important for logistic regression. So, um, um, so for linear regression, the basically the the hypothesis is whatever our slope and intercept are. Uh, the hypothesis is just take the, the the slope times the input feature, add in the intercept. That's going to be my prediction. Uh, for, for uh, you know, a new value that I want to predict for. Uh, later on, we'll have to do something that's a little bit more complicated. We'll, we'll do that, but then we'll also put it through what's called a hypothesis function here, the, the logistic function for logistic regression. Um, okay, but uh, that means, though, for example, if you didn't quite follow that, that we can do stuff like this. So, so we can turn this into... Uh, matrices or vectors and just do vector matrix multiplication, right? So um, if I have um, my uh, intercept, the B for my line, that's my model, and the slope, M for my line, um, I can put them into an array that we call theta here, um, and then I can calculate my Y hats um, like we do here. Um, so if I want to do my predictions for all my inputs, I have to add in my dummy column by hand because I'm basically going to be multiplying each one of these, uh, 1, 2,000, 104 times uh, that and that, right? So the 1 times my intercept plus the, uh, the, uh, the square foot times my slope should give me, me, me the predicted price for the first value. But I can do all these in one vectorized operation having a... Uh, x with that dummy constant like this um, and having my theta like this right? um, and it works like this as shown here so y hat um, is just the dot product um, it's just the matrix multiplication of the theta vector times the transpose of x so that should be basically the predicted house price for my best fit line model for the first one right so if you multiply uh, 2,104 times my best slope and add in the intercept, you get a predicted value of 354. Or, you know, make certain you understand this if I'm going too fast. Or another way to say that is from the model for my theta 0 and theta 1, if I want to predict what the price should be for a house that has uh, 2,104 square foot, we can go back to the, our model here. So 2,104 square foot is about right there. So I should be predicting the, that 335 or whatever, right? So the actual value at 2,100 square foot would, might have been above or below that, but my predicted value is going to be on my, my line, my best linear model um, uh, that we fit to the data. Okay. All right, anyway, so hopefully people are following that. It, it's... Um, it's, it's easy if you understand what's going on here, but uh, this becomes useful. So if we turn this into matrices and vectors, we can um, uh, uh, do things in, in like, like this, like in a single step. Like, for example, we can get all of our predictions for our original data that we fit the model with, or we can get all the predictions for a whole new set of data in one matrix operation like this right, for some unseen data. Um, oh yeah, I can't remember the way our textbook does it, so you might see this in different, so you can actually also get the same result. Uh, you get a different shaped result, so, so notice the difference here is I had a vector, a 47 item one dimensional vector, if I did it theta times x transpose, um, or you can just do um, 
uh, x times theta, and you get a, um, um, the shape is you get a two-dimensional with just one row. Uh, that, but, but you get the same results. So if I had done it, I don't know why I didn't do it both ways in the, the example here. So originally we got just a vector of 47 predicted items. Uh, this one you get a um, um, you get just a, a different shape because of the way the matrix multiplication works. Although I didn't get a different shape. Um, anyway, uh, um, I, I just I did want to make the point that uh, the, the, yeah sometimes you do have to reshape things to get the the multiplication to work correctly. So that can be uh, uh, some people can have uh, that can be mysterious to people, but but yeah. So sometimes you'll get it out as a vector, or you did have to do that for this second assignment. So so you might have to if you have a vector, you might have to change it into like a column matrix, so two dimensional with just one column or things like that sometimes you need to do. So. Um, all right, and, and yeah, to drive the point home here, um, um, so again, I mean, I'm using, I'm using all the data that we use the, the, the uh, polyfit function for, right? So the polyfit told us that the best slope and intercept were those given ones, and then I just re-predicted, so what would be my predicted house for all of the data that I trained with, right? So what this, there should be one corresponding point on my line, my model, for every data point. So, you know, so uh, this is leading up to, um, so we can now finally talk about the cost function, because the cost function is really how far away every point is, the prediction is from the actual value, right? So this prediction was pretty close. Um, uh, this one was almost right on, but some of them are pretty far away. Like like this one here uh, had a pretty big error. Uh, it, its prediction would have been down here. So for some reason, this relatively small house had a much higher price in the database. Looks like it was maybe a bit of an outlier. Um, but right. um, Okay, so yeah, still got maybe just enough time to finish up the basics of, of the cost function here. So if you follow that so far, I mean, really, the, the next step to the cost function is should be intuitive, right? So if I just measure how bad of, an, of a prediction each one of these was from my model, uh, and sum those up, I get an overall idea of how bad, how far away my model is in predicting, all right? So then I really need to be able to, to draw some multiple ones on here. So given that same set of data here, we, something has already told us that the best model was this. So I need some way to calculate how good, uh, how much error there was for that model and all the data I'm fitting versus like if I have another model here or another model here. So any other line, I also want to be able to calculate that same um, estimate of, of how good the fit is by looking at how much error there is between my model and every point that I'm trying to, to fit a model to. All right. Again, I'm only really, you're, you can only kind of visualize what we've already been told is the best model, but you can, there's an infinite number of other models. So, you know, I could have, I could have a model of a line that goes this way, or a model with the same slope that's lower or higher, right? right. Um, so that's really all the cost function is, okay? So, um, like for the very first item, uh, the actual value that we were trying to fit uh, had a price of $399.9,000. The prediction, uh, if you look at that for that best fitting model, was that. So it had an error of, of minus 45, right? So, um, um, so 
so I maybe should have shown what uh, what uh, X was there, but um, so yeah, so that was a price that had that was a house that had two thousand one hundred four square feet, right? So that was down here. Uh, that was one of the points we were using before. So um, uh, it had an actual price of um, three hundred. 399, so pretty close to 400,000. So it's probably this point right there, right? Uh, and it's predicted down here. So uh, a difference of 47,000 dollars in that case. Right? Um, but um, because we can do vec uh, uh, vector vectorized operations, I can do the error for all those. So we call that the error. Right, so that's just the difference between the prediction um, and the uh, actual value that we're trying to fit. So we end up with the errors for all 47 points like that. Uh, it's just the difference between the, the actual value and the predicted value. Right. Um, now, one property of the best line is it's going to actually have an error of zero if you just sum those all up. So that's not really telling you anything because basically the best line should have the property that um, uh, there's an equal amount of stuff above and below. So they, they, the, the errors above and below cancel everybody out. Um, but the line that's not best is going to have more, like the line below this has a much more stuff above than below, but it can't be the best line uh, in that case. Right? So it's going to have a lot more error, if you follow me. So, um, uh, but this wouldn't be too useful, so I really need something that, that's really just a sum of the magnitudes of the errors to get an idea of how, how much error there was in total between my predictions and my values, right? So, you know, an easy thought, what, what occurs to most people is, let's just do the absolute value, right? Because some of the errors, are, some of the predictions were below, some were, were above, so if I just take the absolute value and sum those up, um, I get an idea of what the sum is of the magnitude of the errors. Right? Um, so yeah, this is known as the absolute error. This is used as a, a cost function or a fitness function um, in some contexts. Um, and uh, so normally what we do is we average that. So uh, what you want to know is what on average is the magnitude of my error. So this is the the uh, the absolute the 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 um, um, the, the, the mean absolute error, right? So um, this is just the absolute error and take the average or the mean of it. Um, so hopefully if, if you read through or watch through the, the Dr. Ring's lecture videos, this math won't intimidate you. Um, um, oh, uh, so I skipped over, I don't know why, but uh, normally instead of using the absolute value, we use the square of the value, right? So, so take, instead of taking the absolute value, we will just square those. So, so we can just square the values and sum those up. So that's the sum squared error, SSE. Um, and then you can divide that by M to get the mean sum squared error. Right? So th those are different. Um, uh, and, you could, and, and you were calculating these on your assignment too. So this is really the mean squared error. Um, and if, if you want, want the root mean squared error, then you can take the square root. So since you're squaring it, Taking the square root takes it back to about the same um, units as you had before. But again, you won't get exactly the same, right? So the, the mean absolute error was 52. The mean of the sum squared error, the, the root mean of the sum squared error is 64 in this case. Okay. Uh, but for reasons that uh, we'll have to go into later, we usually use the square rather than the absolute value. Uh, it, it, makes, it makes the uh, fitting the, the, the cost function mathematically tractable to use the square here for one reason. So um, back to notation. So don't be scared by this stuff. So you see a lot of this if you watch Dr. Ring's videos or you'll get some more of this uh, here in the next three weeks. This is just saying mathematically notation what we just did. So if you take, this is really uh, uh, right here, this is calculating the prediction. So that's y hat by taking 
theta, all the thetas times all the x's. So that's really y hat. So y hat minus the true values is the errors. If you take the errors and square them, you get the square of the errors. And then this is summing them up. So if you sum up all of the m values, you get the sum of the squared errors. And if you divide by m, you get the mean of the sum squared errors. And then I didn't show, but if you want to get the root mean squared error, you just take the square root of all that to get the root mean squared error, right? Um, all right, and again, some mathematical notation. So uh, they, we often mathematically use an upper i. That really corresponds to an index i, right? So the, the, we're summing up all of the 47 items in x so if we're doing that in Python, we would use i into x or i into y to get the one particular element. Right? But yeah, i is the index of the element number, uh, the, the sample number that we have uh, in equations like this. Um, our textbook might go from 1 to m. Uh, I often change this from 0 to m minus 1 because then it more directly corresponds to Python where we use zero-based indexing. Right, so, so we can directly encode something like this in Python where the item at index zero is our first sample and so on. Um, okay, and uh, so I probably, I mean, I, I kind of skipped over, so right, so we give an example of the sum squared error. So, so yeah, the reason why I didn't have that above here is I do talk about the, uh, the root mean squared error, calculating it down here. Um, Okay, let's skip over. Yeah, uh, uh, um, basically that is what we're going to be using. We're going to be using the root mean squared error as our fitness function. Okay, uh, and I'll leave it there today. Uh, but uh, um, this is a measure we can always do. So for any model, we can always calculate the root mean squared error. And and the argument is the one that has the smallest of that is the best line, is the best fitted line for our model. All right. Okay, yep, so I'll leave you with that. Um, but uh, we'll go into that more. Uh, but yeah, now we can start talking about polynomial regression and some other stuff on Thursday.